What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and in today's episode of the Super Smash Bros. and Platform Fighter tutorial series, we're going to be going over improved mechanics for our movement, attacks, keyboard and controller, all sorts of different things. We're basically going to make sure that keyboard inputs and controller inputs line up perfectly so that we can play the game with whatever input device we want and clean up a few issues as well for things like being able to move while attacking, and having the character face the wrong orientation on controller. And so you'll see here, if I am to use an attack and try to move, I will be stuck not moving until that attack is finished. Additionally, if I am moving and I perform an attack, you'll see that the movement actually stops as soon as I perform the attack. That's what we want. I can also now charge attacks with my other characters. So even though I'm on one input device, we weren't able to charge the attacks for all characters due to a little bug in our character blueprint. We're going to fix that up today, make sure that works as well. And so we have just a lot of very nice improvements to have for our game so we can keep going forward without having to deal with these little issues along the way. Now before we get into this episode, if you want to check out everything else we've done in this platform fighter tutorial series, you can click this icon in the top right corner right here. This will show you how we did things like hitboxes, items, game modes, and all that fun stuff. Alternatively, if you just care about the enhancements for this episode, I do recommend you watch the episode based on controllers in the series because we are going to be improving some of the logic that we implemented in those episodes. And lastly, I'd like to thank my Patreon members and YouTube memberships for all the help, all the love that you guys have given. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it, and I'm so excited to continue to show you what we are making in this game. With all that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. We're going to start in our code today, and we're going to specifically go to our SSB template character.cpp. In here, we want to restrict movement when we're doing certain actions, such as attacking. It could be whatever you want. And to do that, I'm going to set my can move boolean. And so in my case, can move is being used to stop any character movement during their entrance animations, and that's good. But we can use it for more than just that. So I'm going to scroll down to my first attack function, which is just called basic attack. In this function, we were checking to see if we could move before performing the attack, as well as a few other things just to make sure that the character could actually attack. But we weren't ever setting can move to be false in here. You can set can move to be false anywhere in your basic attack. Doing this will allow you to disable movement of the character when picking up an item, using the item's ability, or using a basic attack. That's what will happen if you put it directly inside this first if statement. So I'm actually going to move this out. And we will only stop moving when using a basic attack. Anything with items won't stop our movement right now because you can be walking by an item and pick it up. And I think that's perfectly fine. To do this logic, we'll want to make sure that we go to the else where there's no item equipped and we have no overlapped item, so we're not picking up an item either. So in the else, within the else, we're going to set can move to be false. And I'm going to change this comment to be disable movement of the character when using a basic attack. Again, you can put it in these other places. This is fine. I actually had it up here because I wanted the character to stop moving during those points. But then when I was playing with it and actually using that, I didn't think that it felt right. I think stopping the character from moving when picking up things or when using item attacks doesn't feel great from a gameplay perspective. So I've decided to put it in here instead. Now, we don't have to set this in things like the chargeable attacks, like the basic smash attack, because that function is called from this timer that is triggered from the basic attack function. So can move will already be false at this point. We don't need to set it. Let's also go to our special attack function. And in here, you can set can move where you want it to be. So again, I had set can move to be false to disable movement of the character when using an item special ability or using a special attack. But again, due to the gameplay mechanics that I felt while testing, I think it should only be false when using a special attack, not when using an item special attack. But again, it is entirely up to you. Feel free to put it where you'd like it. I'm going to move it inside of my else statement. So if we don't have an item equipped, we want to disable movement. 
and I'm going to take this out of the comment so it just says disable movement of the character when using a special attack. Again, you do not need to put it in special held attack in any way. Now the grab function is another one. So grab is your grapple where you got to actually grab a player. In this case, we haven't implemented that yet in the series. What we've implemented is throwing the item. I don't want to stop movement when throwing the item. This time I actually skipped all that the first time around. So I go to my else statement on if equipped item, basically saying we have no equipped item. And that is where we will try to attempt the grab. Even though the logic in here isn't filled out, we know that we don't want the character to be able to move during the grab animation and any other corresponding grab logic. So at this point we can set can move to be false. And those are the three main places. You can set them in other things like start blocking and lose life and break block shield and all these different places, but it's not really re required that you do that because we set character states during things like blocking and break block shield to stunned or blocking, which we already check for in our move right function. So in move right, we check for blocking and we check for stunned. So we're not gonna be able to move in those points anyway. We don't have character states for specific attacks, which is why we're setting can move to be false directly in those functions. Now the next thing to go to is our move right logic. There was something that we had done in move right controller that we did not transfer over to our move right function. So we have two functions for moving, move right and move right controller. They're different mainly just because of dead zones right now, but they can differ in a lot of different ways if we choose to do that. However, we don't want them both to be firing all the time. We either want the move right function to be firing on the character or the move right controller function to be firing on the character, not both. So in move right controller, we were grabbing our base game instance, and then we were checking to see if the base game instance had the Boolean set is device used for multiple players. And if that was false, we went into the move right controller logic. Essentially what this means is if we are not on a device where multiple players are using it, such as a keyboard, everyone has their own input device. So basically everyone is using a controller. And if everyone's using a controller, we don't need to do any of that other keyboard mode logic that we have in move right. So if this Boolean was false and we weren't having multiple players on one keyboard or one device, then we essentially didn't do anything in the move right controller function. And that's good. However, the move right function was still firing freely regardless. So even if this Boolean was false and we went into the move right controller logic, the move right logic was still functioning all the time. Every single frame it was being updated. What we want to do now is transfer that behavior from the move right controller function into the move right function. So we need to add two if statements to the top of move right. The first one is going to grab our base game instance reference, and the second one is going to check the corresponding variable. So if auto base game instance, which is just automatically going to assign the proper type to this variable, and we're going to cast the game instance that we get from the world or the current game instance that is in use to our game instance type, which is the U base game instance. And we're doing that so we can grab the variable that we need to check. If this if statement succeeds, we know that we've successfully gotten the base game instance, which means we can check the variable. So in our next if statement, we need to grab base game instance, arrow operator, is device used for multiple players. Now notice move right controller checks exclamation mark base game instance is device used for multiple players. This means we're checking to see if the device is not used for multiple players. That's what the exclamation mark means. It means not or the opposite. In move right, we don't want to check that because we only want to do the standard move right logic if we're not using a controller. And we're not using a controller if all of the players are working off of the same input device. So there is one little difference there. But now if we are using a controller, the move right function will be skipped similarly to how the move right controller function is skipped when not using a controller. That is not only good for performance, but it also can fix some bugs specifically with character state and direction when moving around. Now, one other thing to do in move right controller. So in move right controller, we had these dead zones. We technically have them in our standard move right as well but we just check to see if the value is less than zero or the value is greater than zero. 
With keyboards, it's pretty easy because if it's not pressed, it's zero. If it is pressed, it's the value that we assign to that key. But with controllers, it's a little bit more difficult. So we added dead zones. So I was checking for 0.1F to make sure that if the stick was drifting a little bit, it counted at zero if it wasn't so far to the left or so far to the right. There was a minor mistake that I had made though. I was checking to see if the value was less than 0.1F and the value was greater than 0.1F. But this isn't really correct because the value can be less than 0.1F and still be zero because zero is less than 0.1F. Which means if you weren't moving the stick, the character state would be set to moving left. The character would constantly be forced to look in the left direction when using controller, even if you were moving to the right. Instead, this first if statement should be if value is less than negative 0.1F, and the other if statement should be else if the value is greater than 0.1F. The else will handle the range from negative 0.1F to 0.1F, and that's what we want. Now, the last thing we want to do is update our animation blueprint to set can move back to true once the characters have finished their animations, specifically their attack animations, because we want the character to be able to move again after attacking. And to do that, we can go into our animation blueprint for the character, and we can go to our default state machine and click on the idle state. Essentially, anytime we return to the idle state, I want to set the character to be able to move. If we enter this state, we're able to move. Even if we transition to something immediately after that stops us from moving again, that's okay. But the very frame that we enter this state, we want to say we can move again, we can walk freely, we can do all those things that are blocked when we're not able to move. If you click on your idle state or really any state, you can get these details here, such as entered state, left state, and fully blended state event. On our entered state, event, I want to add a new anim notify, and I've called this one entered idle. And anytime we enter idle, we're going to set can move to be true. So if I go into my event graph, I can then search for this event. And we want event anim notify entered idle. And I'll bring it up just like this. In this case, it does the same thing that exit entrance does. So exit entrance is when we finish our entrance animation and it just makes it so we can move. Simple enough. That's what we want to do when we enter the idle state. You don't have to mix these events though. You can just have a completely separate event and do this logic. So that's up to you. I'm just doing this because it's convenient for me right now. But really what we want to do is grab our character reference, which is the owner of this animation blueprint and set can move on it and make sure that we set chem mode to be true and then plug it in. There's one other thing I wanna show you and that is gonna be in our character blueprint and that is going to be for our charge attacks for multiple characters on one device. So if we go to our character BPs and we're gonna to go to the base character BP, we have these sections for player two, three, and four. In these sections, we handle the events done in the input action, such as jump P2, jump P3, jump P4, or our basic attacks, or whatever they may be, and we check the corresponding reference and call the correct function on it. Well, for basic attack P2, basic attack P3, basic attack P4, special attack P2, special attack P3, and special attack P4, we need to make sure that we're calling both the pressed and released events for each of these characters. So previously in the series, we only had the pressed event going for our attacks for each of our characters. So they couldn't properly charge their attacks unless they were player one. So on pressed of basic attack P2, P3, P4, we need to get the corresponding player reference like player two, player three, player four reference and call the basic attack function. But on release of the basic attack, P2, P3, P4, we need to get the corresponding player reference and call it the smash attack function, basic smash attack. And to do that, it's very simple. Grab your reference, get it, convert it to a validated get to make sure it's valid. And only if it's valid, drag off and call it basic smash attack. 
you'll see this is the same for each of these. And make sure to do this for your special attack as well. So special attack P2 calls special attack on press, but special attack P2 calls special held attack on release. And you can see this is also the same for all of these events. Those changes will allow us to have a much smoother game. They're very small changes, but they're very important in the long run. Now, remember that in our base game mode BP, begin play, we grab our base game instance, and since we don't have automatic detection for controllers or keyboard yet, we do have to manually set this boolean. So if you're playing on one device, such as a keyboard, make sure this boolean is checked. And then if you want to test out your controller logic, just disable this boolean, set it to false, and then run the game. I'm going to put it back to true so that I can use my keyboard. But now keyboard and controller should both work very nicely. If you enjoyed and this helped you make your game better, please subscribe and please consider donating to the Patreon or YouTube membership for extra perks. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. It's completely free and I'd be happy to help you out with any of the problems that you ran into and get you situated so you can keep working on your game. Like I said guys, that's all I got, so thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye guys.